First of all, welcome everybody. And uh, secondly, tonight's subject really couldn't be closer to home for Pouchies uh, throughout the UK and beyond, because we have the pleasure of um, two world experts. Zara always grimaces when I say world experts. Um, I think they're world experts on uh, pouch uh, care. In the, in the form of Petya Marinova, who's pouch nurse specialist at St. Mark's, and Zara, who probably needs uh, no further introduction, but she wrote the book on pouches, literally. And um, the, these two ladies are part of a fabulous team at St. Mark's who provide um, probably world-class uh, support uh, for pouch patients. And what, what these uh, ladies and the team uh, don't know about pouches isn't worth knowing. So it, this is a fabulous, fabulous opportunity for us. I'm delighted to say that both ladies have joined the, the Board of Trustees at the Red Lion Group, and we benefit hugely from their expertise and uh, clinical input. Uh, so um, I'm not going to uh, carry on wittering any more than I need to, because you're not here to listen to me. Uh, but um, what I'd like to do is hand you over to Petya, who's going to talk for a while about um, all things pouch nurse, uh, from uh, uh, St Mark's perspective, and um, and then invite a Q&A at the end, which um, um, hopefully we can all learn new things from. Um, Petya, over to you, and thank you so much for uh, agreeing to uh, do this presentation. Thank you, thank you everyone. Good evening, and just let me load this, and we can start. Okay, so the topic we are going to talk about, as you mentioned, is St. Mark Hospital and life after the pandemic. Do we still need to wait or we can go ahead? No, I think we're, we're good to go. I mean, it's uh, seven minutes in, so let's crack on. Okay, good. The aim of the presentation is to talk about mitigating the risk to pouch patients following COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we are also going to talk about our move to Central Middlesex Hospital and everything we've been doing in order to ensure future proving of the pouch nursing service. I think it's very important we start with giving you a bit of a background to what our hospital at St. Mark's did initially at the beginning of the pandemic in order to ensure that the risk for pouch patients are reduced during the pandemic. Um, soon after, we had the first patients announced in the UK, COVID positive patients, Northwick Park Hospital became one of the few major receiving centers for COVID-19 patients. And that meant inevitably for St. Mark Hospital that it would also be affected as at the time, it was solely based at Norwich Park Hospital with the enormous number of new positive patients coming into the hospital. The surge was quite huge initially with the first wave. And this is why our trust decided early on to stop all outpatient clinic appointments in order to ensure that the risk for both patients and staff are reduced in, in regards to transmission of COVID-19. Additionally, again, all non-emergency operations with the, during the first wave were put on hold. This is because all our theaters and intensive care units were being transformed into COVID wards in order to be able to care for all these patients. With our services being on hold or very limited, that as well meant for our pouch and stoma nursing team to be redeployed to COVID positive wards to help with the demand of staff to be able to care for all these COVID positive patients. That was initially and lasted pretty much during the whole first wave, but soon after with the initial wave, our hospital had to look into other ways for us to continue to perform surgeries and be able to look after our patients. And this is why 
soon it was decided that it would be best to move into private hospitals where we can continue with surgeries and continue to ensure that patient care is not compromised. And since then, for the past 18 months, we've been pretty much across three to five hospitals on an average, looking after all our St. Mark's patients. Okay, with um, the end of the first wave, our hospital had to look as well into planning what would happen if there was to be a second wave of COVID. And that's how it was decided. It would be safe for all our St. Mark's patients if we move to Central Middle Sex Hospital temporarily in order to ensure that we will continue to have our service running. And this was initiated October last year as a temporary move. Now, a year later, we are still between two hospitals. We have patients at both Central Middlesex Hospital and Norfolk Park, as well as some surgeries are happening in the London Clinic as well. This is because Central Middlesex Hospital does not have all the essential services still. And especially for now, Norfolk Park remains access point for emergency patients and patients requiring intensive care because Central Middlesex Hospital for the time being does not have an emergency department and does not have intensive care unit. So all elective surgeries do, do, do not require intensive care, however, are performed at Central Middlesex Hospital. Same for all outpatient clinic appointments. Those have moved now from Norfolk Park and are happening at Central Middlesex Hospital. However, some investigations such as endoscopy and X-ray remain at Norfolk Park mainly. So if any of you have appointments and receive a letter, it's very important that you just have a look, make sure, double check that you are going at the right place, just because some of these investigations might be happening either at Central Middlesex or Norfolk Park. However, with all everything that has been happening for the past 18 months, with pandemic, with the move and everything in between, we at St. Mark's, our pouch nursing service, have been there for our, our patients. We've continued to, to provide all the care and to do everything we've been doing even before the pandemic. And most of you are familiar with everything that the pouch nurses at St. Mark's do, but for those of you who do not know, I'm just going to go quickly into detail what our role involves and what we actually do. Firstly, we provide clinical care for all our patients during their entire journey from before having surgery and then post, post or follow up. It includes in the hospital as well, in the community. We are also um, first line of contact for our patients whenever any complications occur. And we are there always for them for lifestyle and psychosocial support. Whenever somebody might need advice or any information or reassurance, this is why we are here. Another thing we do is audits, which allows us to make sure we constantly improve our service. We do that through our pouch patient database that we keep and con continuously update. We also work closely with our support groups and our patients, and we try our best to listen to their feedback and improve our service in order to be able to meet their needs. Um, another thing we do is education, which probably many of you might have crossed with different level of care, across the country. Unfortunately, pouches, as many of you may know, are not that familiar, not that common. And unfortunately, some healthcare professionals do not really know how to properly care for people with a pouch. This is why it's very important for us to provide that support and continue to educate people across the country both hospital, multidisciplinary team, GPs, community staff, 
nationally and internationally in order to make sure that everybody knows what they're doing. So all our pouch patients receive good enough care for no matter where they are. Research is another thing we are very involved in, which is very important for us because it ensures evidence-based practice. And we are actively involved in protocol and pathway development, publications in national and international journals, presenting on national and international level. But I'm going to talk to you about all the exciting research projects and things we've been doing a bit later in the presentation. And lastly, we manage independently our pouch nerve like clinics, both in face-to-face -face clinics and remotely via telephone, virtual, and email advice line. This allows us to provide care for our patients in timely manner and ensure that things like hospital admissions or GP and consultant appointments are prevented so we can assist them before the need for them to go to a hospital or meet their consultants or their GPs. We also work in joint consultant clinics with our consultants where we see patients with more complex needs. And we also have our non-medical prescribers, which for now is Zara and hopefully soon the rest of us, which allows us to prescribe medications that our patient needs without having to delay treatment waiting for the consultants. Currently, our partner service has two nurses, myself and Zara. I work full-time as a pouch nurse, and Zara works part-time as a pouch nurse, and the other half of her job in includes her management and her consultant nurse responsibilities, but she's always there to support me if needed. Additionally, our pouch service has been through quite a lot of changes during the past couple of years as well. We had two senior pouch nurses leave the service, as many of you probably know, and we had new staff members join, including myself. And another thing as well we've been doing, especially during the pandemic, is support our stoma nurse think team colleagues, especially with us having patients across three to five hospitals at the time. And as I mentioned, during the pandemic, We've been seeing patients across three to five hospitals and mainly at Northwick Park, Clement and Churchill, and later as well, Central Middlesex Hospital. During the pandemic last year, we had to look after in hospital for 91 patients, which in comparison, if you have a look at the chart, the year before COVID began were 159. Those were including elective patients, which during the pandemic was not the case. We were mostly looking after people with emergency admissions. Same thing goes for our outpatient clinics. Despite the fact that our hospital had to put on hold most of face-to-face -face clinic appointments, we still managed to, look, to assist 843 patients during the pandemic mostly remotely via emails, telephone and video advice line, but also in face-to-face -face clinics. And again, if you have a look at our chart from the year before, we had 1,055 patients we were assisting during, before the pandemic. Those were as well many routine follow-up appointments, which unfortunately were not happening during COVID. And as I mentioned, our hospital had to put on hold part, all outpatient appointments face to face in order to ensure that there is no risk for transmission of COVID for all patients and, and as well staff. And this meant as well for us that we have to look into something else in order to ensure that we continue to support our patients. And soon after, 
we realized that many of our face-to-face -face appointments could actually be done as well virtually via video consultations and therefore the trust in invested in new computers so we were able to, to provide this service and meet the needs of our patients and continue to support them before the pandemic we were seeing about 30 percent of our patients in face-to-face -face clinics which reduced to 10 percent during the pandemic and most of the, them were done remotely Another thing that was highlighted for us during the pandemic is the need for us to work on developing new pathways and protocols and as well work on um, updating our roadmap. We finalized our pouch patient pathway, which I realize it might be a bit difficult for you to see, but we can share this with you later. And we also have this on our website, which you can find there. I will show you this later, which is, this is a unique for St. Mark's pathway, which samples the journey of our patients from before having a pouch, then after having the closure with a new pouch and also people with a failed pouch that have either pouch excision or pouch failure. We've also designed the pouch surgery poster. That was something Zara and I and my sister Rally and as well Mr. Warsavatarni worked on. And it's been very important for us and especially during the pandemic with not being able to see that many people in person and doing a lot of consultations uh, virtually, especially with preparing patients for surgery, potential pouch patients for the future. It's been a great visual aid for them as it shows them the different steps and helps them understand better what we're doing, what the pouch looks like and its anatomy and how it works. Not only has been very useful for our patients preparing them for surgery, but also other healthcare professionals because it helps them also better understand how the pouch work, what's the anatomy of the pouch and physiology. And it's been quite helpful as well for other healthcare professionals. The other thing we've worked on, which is gonna be published this month at the British Journal of Nursing is our pouch quality of life article, this is the first time you're seeing it. It has not been published. So this is just uh, a snippet of it. And it's gonna be published in the next few weeks at the British Journal of Nursing, which is we are very proud of because it took few, quite a few years to finish and it shows a novel way how we follow up all our patients after closure of, our, of their stoma. And what we are hoping as well is that it would serve us an example for other hospitals. So it could actually guide them to have also to be able to provide similar structured follow-up for patients and ensure better care for them once they're discharged from after the closure. And as I mentioned earlier, we worked on some protocols. We updated some old ones and we developed some new ones. This is our partners let clinic protocol. It samples all the services we provide. It also tells you how this can be accessed. It samples what we, what kind of service we provide independently, what we do together with the consultants, and what we need to escalate to the consultants. We also have our new protocol for use of Medina catheters and irrigation devices in pouches, dysfunctional pouches. And another thing that we have is our protocol for treatment of cathitis. Some of you might have seen before, but this is something as well we've been working on during the pandemic. And this is protocol for management of suspected pouchitis, which we had for quite for a few years now and our protocol for treatment of diversion pachitis. This is a new protocol, which is for people with actually with defunction pouch. And another thing that's been 
very useful during the pandemic, but before even more is our pouch book, which is written by Zara. It's been around for a few years now. It's available on our website if you would like a copy. It's been very important during the pandemic with especially preparing future pouch patients for surgery remotely. And it will be very helpful as well for managing potential complications with people which we have not been able to see in person. The book's been really good, of good use during the pandemic for this kind of um, purposes. And another thing we've been doing continuously before, but even more now is keep our pouch patient databases. We continuously update those as they really help us better understand the needs of our patients and what we need to improve and also we've been working closely with the consultants sharing our data so I can actually help them update as well the national registry for pouch patients. And moving forward, we are very excited as well about the future. We have many exciting projects planned for the future. But one thing we knew that in order to be able to do all this, we are going to need help. And this is why from next week, from the beginning of next month, we're having a new pouch joining our team. Um, this is Rally. Most of you might know her. For those of you who don't, she, yes, don't be confused. She is my twin sister. Uh, that is also a twin. Being a twin at the pouch service at St. Mark's is kind of a tendency that's been going on for many years now. Um, Rally has been a storm nurse at St. Mark's for the past two years, and she's been helping Zara and I with pouch patients as well. Another thing we are excited about is to continue working closely with support groups and our patients. We've always been involved in this. We try to work closely with the Red Lion and as well the IH support group. Another thing which we think is very important when we talk about future proving our service is education, enhanced education for nurses, medical, surgical staff. And we have quite a few things planned for the future as we believe that would help make sure that everybody is more educated about pouches and how to provide correctly a better care for them. Also, raise awareness and combat misinformation among patients and make sure everybody is well informed, have realistic expectations. Another thing is we cannot talk about future without digitalization of our service, which we've been working very hard on for the past few months. And we are slowly transitioning from paper to digital documentation, which has been quite amazing if, as it helps us as well be more flexible, be able to work from home and also be more efficient with everything we do. Also, we've been trying to be much more present online. We've updated our website. We now have a, a QR code and we are much more involved in social media. This is our QR code. If you want to use your smartphone, you can scan it with your camera, or I'll just show you our website for those of you who have not seen it before. We have we update it regularly and it has quite a lot of information about our stoma and pouch teams. Oh, most of our protocols and pathways are there as well and everything we've been working on. There is a lot of information for patients that they can read, a lot of links. There are also a lot of information for support groups, how to get in touch with uh, support groups as well, such as the Red Lion support group. And we have our books also that you can have a look there. Those are our protocols and everything. This is the pouch patient pathway I was showing you earlier, which you can have a look there. We can also share it with you later. This is Zara's book. 
Also, we've updated our new business cards, which we've tried to put all the information you may need. If you would like to contact us, this is our phone number, this is our email address, and this is our website, which you can also access with our QR code. So if you need us, this is how you can get in touch with us. And again, for the future, we have a lot of research projects we are very excited about. We've just started our pouch irrigation trials for both patients with evacuation problems as well as people with a defunction pouch. So if you think that's something you might be interested in, we have quite promising results for, for the patients that started using it. So if you think that's something you would like to consider, please do contact us and we can see how we can arrange to see you and maybe try this if that's the most appropriate thing for you. Another thing we are in the process of starting is having annual follow-up for all our patients. So if you have not seen one of us recently, please do contact us. We can arrange for appointment and just have a chat, see how you're getting on and just if there are any issues that we can discuss. And the other thing with the pandemic and us moving to Central Middlesex, we have a bit more changes coming for St. Mark's. We've just recently, our hospital St. Mark's as part of the London Northwest uh, University Hospital Trust started discussions with Imperial College Healthcare Trust and Hillingdon Hospital regarding consolidating all pouch surgeries in Northwest London with the plan for it to be St. Mark's to be hub for all these surgeries, which would be very beneficial for all patients, for the surgeons and nursing staff, as it would provide opportunity for practice and learning as we were expecting to have many more cases, many more surgeries, which would be great opportunity for everyone. And on the other hand as well, St. Mark has already an established pouch nursing service. So we are ready for that next step and we are very excited for what the future will bring with that new move. So that's it. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, Sarah and I will be happy to answer them. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. I have to say to everybody, Petra was a little bit nervous about this because she doesn't do a lot of public speaking. That was absolutely um, pitch perfect. Well done. Thanks. Um, I'm trying to get my view so I can see everybody. Let me stop sharing. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I've got everyone. So I can now see everybody. So that was absolutely fantastic. And I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one uh, who was unaware of all the stuff that you're doing, as well as seeing all the pouch patients, all the stuff you're doing in terms of establishing protocols for treatment and um, um, progression of care for pouches, pouches and various, various aspects. And I think the publication in the B, the BJN is going to be the first of its kind anywhere. Um, and uh, it's, it's an absolute fabulous. Um, endorsement of your expertise and skills absolutely fantastic and the, the protocol as well I mean um, and the diagram as well I think I think you called it a poster you know a lot of the time pouches um, express their frustration at dealing with medical professionals who with all due respect to the medical professionals don't know what a pouch is and, uh, you know, GPs come in for quite a lot of uh, criticism in that regard. And GPs can't be fully informed about everything. So having the opportunity for pouches to refer to reference texts like the, the sort of protocols that you're working on is, is a fabulous resource. And I'm sure um, uh, a lot of people would be very interested in accessing that material to share with their, um, their, their GPs around the country. And I, I mean, I'm so impressed. I can't tell you how impressed that uh, those initiatives are and that you're a, a really relatively small team. 
and you're producing this prodigious amount of reference material, which, which really is to your credit. I mean, I don't know when you fit in the time. I don't know when you do that. You saw 800 plus patients in 2020. And, you know, there's only 220 working days in a full year, a full year. So that's four a day before you can start doing other stuff. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm going to throw, throw this open for uh, Q and A. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, for those who've seen this before, it's probably uh, second nature, but just so everyone understands, there's a couple of ways that you can sort of um, announce your intention to ask a question. The first is to switch your camera on. For those of you who are shy, that's fine. Don't have to have your camera on. Um, but if, if you have your camera on and you just put your hand up like that, then it's nice and easy to see. I can see you all on the gallery. If you don't wish to put your camera on, then down on the bottom, if you wiggle your pointer on the screen um, and look at reactions on the far right, you can click on that and you can, um, I think, um, put a hand up or something, uh, anything. And it'll come up on the screen, even if your video is off. So I'll be able to, oh, there you go, raise hand, it's called, that's obvious. Um, so that's a way of doing it. Uh, another way is to click on the chat and ask a question by typing it. So I've got the chat open. Uh, and if you wanted to ask a question there, then you can do that. Um, and Gary's already posted there. Uh, oh, that's to me. We should add the poster to our medical alert. We should indeed, Gary, definitely. Um, but um, let's um, probably the best way to do it is a show of hands if you've got any questions. And I'm going to ask a couple to start. Oh, actually, uh, we've got Mahmood already asking a question. So um, crack on, Mahmood. You, you need to unmute yourself first. OK, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. OK, thanks very much. One wonderful, wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. Is there a way we can get these posters on A4 or laminated kind of things so I can show my GPs or so? They are all available on our website and if you actually click on them, you can download them. And print them, okay. Yeah. Okay, fantastic, thank you. So question from Linda. Um, on the chat function. Um, very nice words about the presentation. Um, if irrigation hurts, is one doing it wrong? Is it important for self-dilatation after procedure performed under general anaesthetic? And furthermore, so these are three separate questions, Linda, you're getting your money's worth. Uh, so first of all, is, if irrigation hurts, is, is, is one doing it wrong? Secondly, is it important for self-dilatation after procedure performed under general anaesthetic, I think? And third, any dietary advice for intermittent obstruction, please? So uh, there's three in one. Very different topics, actually. So should we take, well, which one do you want to take first, Petya? Well, we can start from the beginning, irrigation. Yeah. If, if irrigation hurts, is one doing it wrong? Well, we can't know if you're doing it wrong or not, but it's always a good idea if you think you're struggling and you have any doubts, you can always contact us. We can go over the technique, go over everything step by step and make sure everything's being done correctly. And if there is anything we can do to make things easier for you, that's, that's the best thing to do. Yeah. I mean, presumably, um, it shouldn't hurt. It, I mean, it must feel odd. It must feel odd. For those of us who've never irrigated our pouches, it probably feels weird. But that's different from pain, isn't it? Yeah. Can I, can I just make an important little point? Because mm -hmm. I don't want us to sound like we're being evasive of any questions. Mm -hmm. But we just want to be very careful with our medical advice we give, especially since our talk wasn't really on complications or, or medical advice. And I think it shouldn't, some of these questions, we've just got to, you know, understand your medical history mm. or we give specific advice. So I think we should just be, a little, we can always answer these questions, you know, personally. Yeah, so really, um, 
him all for them. Everybody has to sort of understand, I think, that uh, to be fair to uh, Petya and Zara, um, they may not be familiar with your details or your case, and that's that's obviously outside the scope of tonight. But general questions that might resonate with Pouch experiences, I think, are, are relevant and appropriate. And uh, certainly, we talked a lot about using catheters and uh, irrigation and self-irrigation a lot on the forums recently. So, if if we can stick to general answers and ask Petya and Zara to restrict general answers, that'd be great. So, and then number two, is it, it is important for self-dilatation after procedure performed under general anaesthetic. Linda, do you want to explain a little bit more about that? I'll mute myself. Sorry, hi. There you go. I think the thing, when you read on Facebook pages, the, some people talk about self-dilatation afterwards. And it's not something I've ever heard over here in Ireland. So I'm just wondering, does St. Mark recommend some people to stop dilatate afterwards? What we would usually recommend self-dilatation is usually for people that actually have multiple reoccurrences and have to go back for other dilatation. So in order to avoid all this going for a general anesthetic every few months, what we would usually do if that's appropriate for the particular patient, we will teach them after speaking as well about the with the consultant about the specific case and then teach them if necessary how to use a dilator you just to make sure it avoids you having to go for general anesthetics if strictures occur again. Okay. And last question from Linda was any dietary advice for intermittent obstruction? All right, I'm just gonna okay. sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Some people recommend the Diet Coke. Is there any other small tricks? The so first thing as well is very important to know what's the cause of all these intermittent obstructions because could it is varies quite a lot from one person to another, whether the reason is something you might have eaten that could have caused any obstruction, especially high fiber foods or anything like that is very difficult to digest, or if it's somebody that actually already has problems with adhesion, scar tissue and things like this, it is quite personal. So it's very important we also have the past medical history so we can actually make a proper assessment and advice appropriately. Mm. Mm. We, we had a great deal of uh, feedback from a talk by, um, is it uh, Gabrielle Pufu on dietary advice for um, pouches and that, that generated a great deal of interest and a lot of people have downloaded that from the website uh, subsequently. So it's, diet is uh, obviously, as you know, very important for pouches and uh, you know apple peel and how to avoid it and all the rest of it. So. Um, thank you for that. A question in from, from Patrizia. Patrizia, I hope that pronounced that right. Um, can I know if I'm the only one who cannot empty the pouch unless I use both Aquaflush and Medina catheters? So again, we're coming back to um, uh, um, uh, catheter use to um, evacuate the pouch. So it, some people do, some people don't, but I tell you there's a massive passionate following for Medina catheters amongst the pouch communities, some of the pouch community. And um, mm -hmm. um, it's it's a topic that comes up quite regularly. So here's a question related to the use of pouch uh, catheters. Well, I can only say that, no, it's not only you that has problems emptying the pouch. <clears throat> and as David was saying, Many people use either aqua flush or any kind of irrigation device or the Medina catheter. Some people might use both, but yes, it is you're not the only one that uses this to help empty your pouch. Okay, just to know if 
as I cannot do it completely and I can't do it unless I use those two, mm. two Tampe and Medina. That's why I was quite curious to know if, if it was only me like that, <laughs> but okay. I will be, I will be doing a dilatation soon. So hopefully it will help again. Mm. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your uh, presentation anyway. So it's great. Yeah. Any more questions out there? For the time? I've, I have loads of questions, but um, I wanted to give, make sure everyone gets the opportunity to ask their questions rather than me dominating. Yeah, Howard, welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, David. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the very beginning of your talk. I was, got tied up with something. But I'm, mm. I'm here now, and as Zara will know, uh, she's not very surprised that I've got some comments and questions. Bless her. Firstly, Petra, excellent talk, really, about it. Um, I um, have a number of things I just want to touch on, David, really. Um, don't, don't want to anticipate any questions from you. I was very interested about what you said about the, uh, the defunctioning pouches, which I have, and a follow-up. So when you come out with your research and what have you, I've never been able, Zara, actually, with your wonderful book, which of which you know I have a copy. Um, I was looking through it before the talk, and already, I know it's only about five years old, isn't it? It's, it needs an update in certain areas, and I'm sure you're aware of that. But it's a wonderful book. Really, really it's, it's been very, very useful for me, and it is, goes into every intricate thing. So my question is, Petra, uh, on the research, on the uh, following up for defunctioning, please do that. I'm not the only one who has that, where the pouch failed, and we're back to an ileostomy. And I have the opportunity to come back um, w when I would like, and I, in fact, saw my surgeon yesterday um, about this and touched on it. So that's that question. Can I just jump in just one little thing? Of course, darling. Um, just so Howard is very aware that my thesis was on quality of life in people with defunction pouches. So that was the impetus for writing the book. Um, and um, yes, we will include you as our, you know, patient when we are collecting research. But one thing that Petia skimmed through, if you did notice on the website, is Petia and I, during the last couple of years, has actually written a stoma book um, huh. for patients. So um, I apologize for not writing the pouch book and updating it, um, but that will be our next job. Uh, no criticism intended at all, my <laughs> angel. Um, I'm used to you. Petra, can we then get th those who want it? Um, I would obviously be uh, interested in that uh, thesis or, or whatever you've printed, and we can talk about that outside the meeting. Um, but it would be very useful for, particularly for the patient panels, are, as you know, because uh, a lot of people be interested in that. And fortunately, David and uh, his colleagues have been regulars lately at patient panel meetings and I'll talk David I'll, if you let me write at the end so sort of I'll, I'll just brief uh, a couple of things mm -hmm. I want to say one more thing before I let people other people in and that's about diet and Gabby I um, uh, Zara knows I insist on seeing people if I think I need them and I have a regular um, update with Gabby and Diet is such an intricate thing. I've only ever had, because of her and her, um, her colleagues previously, I've only ever ha had an, a, a one obstruction, which is not very, very pleasant at all. Um, and the reason is because I've adhered very uh, rigorously to her uh, advice about the things David has already mentioned, things like um, apple cores. I don't ever have any fresh fruit. I have a marvelous diet. <laughs> um, um, I, I don't have I miss anything um, because I'm lactose intolerant anyway, so I've had to pay attention to diet. Um, 
but I would certainly, um, I, I, I know you've had Gabby on and I haven't been through her tape. I think she spoke recently, didn't she, David, a couple of months yeah, ago? Yeah, she Gabby. did. And um, she had loads of information on dietary advice, which, you know, is a very, very, very important topic for a lot of pouchies. So really good. Mm. I, I'm, uh, I would urge all the people here and, and all your members, David, to, to sort of liaise um, mm. on diet. I think diet is exceptionally important. And mm. uh, I, I know that Zara in her book mentions a lot about it. But it's not something you do when you're fancy. It's something you've got to live with for the rest of your life. Mm. Um, uh, I have double trouble because I've got an ileostomy, but I don't regard it as that. It, it's it's an optional extra if you like mm. uh, so that's that um the uh, other thing is um uh, down to the situation at the moment which is central middlesex and the problems there i just want to inform your 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 members david that uh, we are i am because i was uh, as, as a lot of people know i was a local councillor i'm liaising with something called the harrow public transport users association to try and get us a shuttle service yeah coming away from the hospital yesterday it took me uh, a 15 minute journey took me over an hour to get out of that place and it's very frustrating and it's not just roadworks it's it's always been like that yeah. so i know i'm digressing a bit but it is a practical thing i'd rather go and see you in uh, at Northwick Park, as I think most of your members would. So I'm, I'm just throwing those things out, Petra. I want to say, as you know, because I'm afraid you know me a bit, um, that they do a fantastic, so I can't mm. speak more highly about all of you, mm. both the pouch and the stoma nurses, about what they do, their care, their knowledge and everything else. Mm. But um, I, can I ask one question, Zara? How... Um, um, what is the uh, expansion rate of people with pouches annually now? It seems to be going up. Pouch, I know pouches are very different from, um, from stomas, but the number of people in the UK and, and Ireland, uh, uh, we've got a, an Irish visitor there, ha, um, what are the figures for, for uh, uh, increase? Because that means more work for you more recruitment uh, for, for necessary staff uh, and for facilities to be, be expanded too. Can you give us some basic statistics about what's going on at the moment? I'm going to see if Petia can do this because it's her talk. I'm here if you need me. I mentioned both of you already, but so, yeah. What we know that with the years, the number of pouches per year have decreased slightly. That's because there are certain medications, especially for IBD patients that are being used now, which require less often for people to have surgery. There are many people that because, unfortunately, due to misinformation, go for the stoma and not for the pouch. That's as well personal choice, but this is something as well we're trying to bring, to raise a bit more awareness and make sure people are well informed and have realistic expectations. But what we know for St. Mark's is that what we used to have, let's say 10, 15 years ago, 60 new pouches a year. Before the pandemic, those were around 30. Last year, we had not more than five to ten mm. new pouches because of the pandemic. Mm. But be, just before the pandemic happened, we actually were having an increase. The previous years, it used to be about 20, 25. And then just before the pandemic, there were over 30 per year, over 35. But then the pandemic happened and we haven't been having many. But the past, let's say, six months, we had probably around 10 new pouches. So we are getting there. Mm. Do, um, do you think that number will increase? I think so. And St. Mark's, yeah. yeah. And St. Mark's, yeah. I think, is the, I think it's, I'm right in saying it's the highest, uh, has the highest number of pouch operations in, in the country. Is that mm. right? Yeah. 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 So... Really, you're growing your center of excellence, uh, number of patients. 
Can I ask how you found, um, you, you commented about um, doing remote uh, assessments and appointments during COVID. And I wondered how you found that compared to face-to-face -to -face, and whether you think that will continue in the future. We are actually currently doing some research where we are after every video consultation we have. We have a feedback form, which we actually fill in with the patient. So we are in the process of researching a bit more how it compares to face-to-face. -to -face. So hopefully soon you have a bit more data about it, but we're currently doing it. But they're quite promising results. Obviously it has pros and cons, but people are very happy about the fact that it allows them to save a lot of expenses on traveling. Yeah. do not have to miss work they don't need to arrange child care or things like this yeah. and actually during the pandemic it has allowed us to have this more personal touch because during virtual consultations we don't need to wear a mask whether when you come in face to face actually we all have masks so in a way actually it's been a bit better communication using our video consultations yeah yeah and just to plug the service even more, because that's my role. During the spare time we had, Rally, who will soon be a pouch nurse, myself and my other stoma colleague, Narissa, we've got another publication in the British Journal of Nursing on our experience with virtual technology, which you can read, hopefully, by the end of the month as well. Wow. I know. Amazing. I know. <laughs> Amazing. Fabulous. So here's another question from me. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, we've got uh, Jennifer has her hand up. Jennifer, please go ahead. Uh, you're muted, Jennifer. You need to just press the button. Oh, that's it. I don't know if I'm saying to you all, but this sounds a silly thing, but exactly what is a dysfunctioning pouch? Is it a pouch people can't cope with because they can't cope with it being different? I eat fruit. I've always eaten fruit. I've had a banana and two of the pears today. Yes, my tummy's rumbling now, but that's what my tummy's doing. And that's the price I pay. And the only concession I would make is if I knew I was going out somewhere tonight, I'd have probably been a little bit more careful because I don't like my tummy rumbling a lot. Yes, I've had blockages. Yeah. But I can't have what I call a serious dysfunction. And I'm just very lucky in 33 years. Mm. So is it just me or what? Or is it just that I decided from day one, this was going to be different. I wasn't going to be back to what other people consider as normal. And by hell, I was going to make it work. And I think what we've all got to accept is nothing would be what other people would call normal. <laughs> so, indeed, yeah, indeed. So what is it? That's what I'm asking. Exactly what classifies as a dysfunctioning pouch? Well, it's quite individual as well. It would depend as well on what you would accept as normal and acceptable function of your pouch. There are people that... Um, would have what some people might consider good function of their pouch and others on the other hand for them that won't be acceptable and it's very individual it really depends on what your expectations are and what you consider to be acceptable for you with the dysfunctional pouch yeah i think you've actually answered it i think probably too can many i people... just clarify something just to help probably as well when we use the word defunctioning, I used to get a little bit confused when I first started because it's one of those words. When we talk pouches, our defunctioned pouches are pouches that no longer work because um, either chronic pouchitis or inflammation and people revert to a stoma mm. or they're defunctioned, that's the word we use, or there's levels of function in like dietary problems or lifestyle so you still have your pouch working you don't have a stoma um so i think that's where it got a little bit confusing because as howard was explaining he's got a defunctioned pouch 
but pouch dysfunction in itself could be ranging on, a, on as Petier explained, a variety of symptoms, bloating, inability to empty, um, inability to eat certain things. But is it Jennifer? Yeah. I think that you, you hit the nail on the head. When you have a pouch, you're not going to be able to probably have the exact same lifestyle as somebody with a healthy colon and rectum. And you have that right attitude that we would like all our pouch patients to, to at least start with, that you've got to work on a pouch. And that's really excellent. Yeah, and I, I do think that's a big extent. It's like only having one leg, isn't it? Yeah, I learned how to hop. Forgot to learn to cope. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think Jennifer, you 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 know your pouch very well. You've had thirty three years, and you've gone through all the adaptation uh, of your your new plumbing, and you know your pouch very well to the extent of knowing that if you eat fruit, your stomach will gurgle, your pouch will gurgle, and um, not to eat too much fruit before you go to the theatre or go to the library. And mm. I think what what I see a great deal of on the forums is people very new to the pouch who are um, concerned about the performance of the pouch early on. And one of the advice um, that I see time and time again from older, uh, not necessarily older, but um, people with older pouches is that things take time to settle down and, um, you know, like years to settle down and um, not to expect things overnight to happen overnight. And I wondered, um, Petra, whether you see that in, in, people with new pouches uh, that the functionality is perhaps not what they expected and and they perhaps need to get to know their pouch and understand its particular foibles and whether that's advice you often give. Yes David we see that very often and this is why actually our pouch nothing service follows up throughout the first year of the pouch after the stomach closure for a whole year mm. this is as well what we describe in detail in that article that's going to be published in the BGN because yeah. it go we have what we've seen that especially initially when mm. things are still settling down everyone needs that extra support and to be routinely checked on just to make sure we are they are to reassure, to make sure that if there are any problems, we can resolve them. And just most of the time is more as well, just being there for them, support them and to reassure them that it just takes time. Yeah. 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 Um, can I ask a general question as well? And I don't want to put you on the spot here. So please feel free to shoot me down if this is inappropriate. But <laughs> um, you, 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 <laughs> there you go. Uh, it's not that difficult, but you have, have often said personally, uh, and and um, uh, in 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 the context of your work as a trustee, that you're available via the helpline and via email uh, to a wide, a broader audience than just people referred to St. Mark's, and. You know, as you know, there's a huge pouch community that are outside of the geographical sort of referral area of St. Mark's. And, and our membership at the Red Lion Group is, is much broader than sort of Harrow and uh, North, Northwest London. Um, and, and there are pouches throughout the UK and many, many of them don't have anywhere like the same expertise in their clinical staff, with all due respect to their clinical staff, that you guys have your intense expertise in pouches. How easy it is, is it, for you on top of your workload when you have people who you don't know, you don't know their medical history, but they're coming to you via the helpline or via email asking for advice when they're not getting the same sort of um, uh, reassurance or advice that they, um, they would want from their local medical teams? That must be very difficult. You don't know them, do you? No, but everyone that calls us, we try to get as much as information from them. Yes, it is very difficult when you don't know somebody. But again, in that case, we can most of the time provide more general advice. And then it would be always best if their GP can actually send a referral with 
all their past medical history so I can have actually a better picture and be mm. able to assess them properly because if we don't have the full picture it might we might as well give them the wrong advice so we can provide general advice for people we don't know but we will always advise them to as well speak mm. to their GP and make sure they send some more information just so we have this full picture and know how to advise them how to help them best and and just to add I think pouch patients in my 20 years of experience are amazing by the time our pouch patients come to us they actually kind of know more than their GPs they actually know what they've eaten they bring diaries they've done their research um, and it's actually well I know it's a, it's a learning curve but you know, a lot of our patients, we can work out what's wrong with them. And a lot of the time, it's just the smallest tweaks. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, as Patricia said, it's, it's like it's not common using an, a, an Aqua Flush and a Medina and a Hagar, but we can kind of make it up. And if it works, and if our patients can do what we say, or if we can perform a um, examination. For example, I had a patient who wasn't ours and she's not under our care. Mm -hmm. um, and she was just saying, she just feels like lost because her consultant, she sees a registrar and she had anal pain. And I said, mm -hmm. well, has anybody physically looked in your pouch? And she was like, well, the doctor kind of poked around but he really didn't have a clue. So it's it was it's quite simple because um, Petty are actually noticed in outpatients. We've got these absolutely fantastic new scoping equipment. They, everything mm. comes up on a camera. Mm. Um, so we've been trained on how to use that. Um, so it's like, it's, 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 it's not easy for us, but with this merge with other trusts in Northwest London, we're really trying to preempt how to run a service with our pouch patients that weren't operated on us or may have had lots of, you know, problems in mm. the past. But it's doable, isn't it, Petia? Yeah. And that's why we've got another pouch nurse coming. Yeah, fantastic. Absolutely. Great. Um, I, hope, I hope they know what they're getting themselves into. I mean, it's fantastic. I know. And, and um, are you uh, receptive to people outside of the UK? Um, dialing in so, I mean we have Arno tonight dialing in from Paris um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm noticing on the J pouch forum uh, Facebook group I'm noticing increasing numbers of non UK uh, people who've got pouches and who are wanting to join for that uh, support that uh, support to know they're not alone and also for the real practical support uh, that you guys must be giving all the time in terms of just simple um, coping mechanisms for people who are having problems. And so, you, you know, for example, if Arno had a problem in Paris, he could give you guys a call. Has he not already? Oh, I don't know. I'm, <laughs> just I'm checking. Patient just confidentiality. Checking. <laughs> I know you may have done. I don't know. I, I did, I, I, yes, I, I did talk to, to Zara on a few occasions. And, and, <laughs> okay, so. and nice to see you. And thanks again, Zara. <laughs> okay, I wasn't see, gonna, no, we're ahead of this game. <laughs> so yeah. um, um, I, I think your fame is going to grow. And I think your, your, the amazing availability that you're offering to Pouchies. Yeah. Um, across the country and also internationally is is uh, I'm, I'm really delighted to hear you're growing your team yeah our That's last good. patient just went back to Bangladesh was it mm. so and we've had a mother who was very um distraught about her son having surgery so we're supporting him in Australia mm. wow Amazing. in between doing everything else Petya and me you know in between <laughs> yeah over lunch yeah fantastic yeah. um do you think that um uh, uh, this is about my last question. I've just noticed um, the time is really ticking on here. We've been going for an hour now, just over an hour. So my last question, and please, everybody on the call, this is going to be, you know, last chance. We can't keep uh, people um, hanging on for ages. But I just wanted to know, um, a lot of the stuff I see on the support groups is, is similar problems being faced by people, and to a greater or lesser extent, it's a big impact for, for people. Um, 
some people seem to have a more positive attitude than others. I think attitude's really important. But a lot of the problems are consistent. Um, do you see that, or are you seeing, as pouches get older and older, are you seeing different problems cropping up? So I know that's a very general question, but I wondered if there was any trends emerging with older pouches that people need to be aware of. Well, what we've seen with people with aging pouches, quite common maybe having a bit more difficulty emptying the pouch. Mm. So that's something that could be quite common. Yeah. 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 I've, I've heard people talk about stretching the pouch. At least that's what they, their clinicians have told them. I don't know if that's whether it's stretching, whether it's um, adhesions, whether it's strictures, or whether there's a whole different range of, of causes for that. The, the, about what, stretching the pouch? Yeah. Over time? Uh, no, the, the inability to empty, whether there's different reasons for that or whether there's a consistent reason. What we know is pouches get old just like when we age, it's just your body gets old. You might need glasses, <laughs> you might have back pain or knee pain. It's same with the pouch. You just accept it as part of your body, not something that's not that it's separate. And just when you get old, everything starts having a bit problems functioning wise it's not just your pouch it's your entire body so just accept the pouch as part of that body that just getting old and just to support Petty's answer Petty, that was excellent but the one of the very first pathway or second protocols that we produced there's actually a list of everything that can go wrong with a pouch the green section we can deal with quite easily and how we deal with it. So, you know, that's, that's really helpful. So people can understand. And unfortunately for pouches, any of those signs or symptoms can occur at any time. Um, some are more obvious as the pouch gets older, but unfortunately a prolapse pouch um, or a pouch that's a bit more stretched or, or may have twisted a bit, these things can happen sometimes at any time. Well, I have to say, I spoke to a pouchy uh, this week who's 91 and has wow. had his pouch for quite a while and he's very happy with it, but um, everyone's different. Um, Gary, you've got your hand up. Oh, you're on mute, Cass. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm muted now. Thank yeah, you. I've, I was just going, some, some people are possibly, yeah, I know you are, David, that I, I spent my recent birthday in in uh, St Mark's Norfolk Park, and had a very appropriate birthday card from somebody, which said, "No long, no longer a reckless youth, more a youthless wreck." <laughs> yeah. so that was very good. But um, going back on some of the things that were discussed tonight, um, I, I think I I must have been incredibly lucky with with my pouch because um, I'd say for over at least 25 years um, I led a totally normal life as if I had a normal colon I didn't even think about having a pouch that I had a pouch I ate what, what I wanted I did whatever I wanted um, but after about 25 years I think it, it did begin to to play up a bit and you know maybe that's part of the aging process there have been different theories about why it was playing up Prof Nichols first suggestion was it was distended um, now it seems there are you know other, other theories about what, what's going on. But the, the main point I was going to make is that I started off in the original St. Mark's in City Road. And I remember being sort of very concerned when St. Mark's moved to Northwick Park, thinking, is St. Mark's going to you know, still be St. Mark's? Because those of us who have been close to St. Mark's become very dependent on it. Um, um, as it turned out, um, St Mark's and Northwick Park has continued to be a, a centre of excellence and it is the National Bowel Hospital and as, and as we know it attracts people from all over the country and all over the world and for those people for whom it's the National Bowel Hospital they're more concerned about 
the continued existence of St Mark's when it moves to central middle sex. They're less concerned about the transport between Harrow and, and, and uh, Hanger Lane than they are about whether St Mark's is going to continue to exist in, in, in some form. And, and that really is my is a concern of a lot of people. We, we hear lots of discussions about what's happening and you're putting th things across very positively tonight, which is, which is reassuring. Um, but I don't know if you have anything to add on, on that subject in terms of the, the, the future and uh, you know, how, how are things going to be? Are the, the move to central Middlesex is looking like it's going to be, a, be permanent rather than just to get us through COVID? That maybe is more questions in one, but do you have any comment to reassure us? Well, um, the plan for it still remains for it to be temporary, but we don't know if temporary won't long term turn to be a permanent. But for now, we don't really have an answer whether we're going to go back to Northwick Park or not. But what we know, our surgeons remain, whether we are Northwick Park or Center Middlesex, our pouch nurses, stomach nurses are there for you. So the service is still there. Just at the moment, we are between two houses, but we don't know whether we're going to stay at Norwood Park at CMH. But no matter what, we're going to continue doing what we are doing. Very good. Excellent answer, Petia. So reassurance to... Uh, as long as we continue. Yeah, here, here. Here, here. Right, last question time. Any more questions out there? We've... Uh, we've Kept pensions are uh, uh, up um, for longer than anticipated. That that's not unusual, and uh, you've been great. Any other last questions? Can I just make a comment? Mm. I'm a bit worried now because I think the student is sort of overtaking or becoming <laughs> the master here. I am so proud of Petia, and mm -hmm. you know. I just want to add a few things because we all have our strengths, but Petty has really done me proud today. And I really look forward to the future. And I know it's a bit daunting for everyone, but I just want to draw some um, points that Petia actually is very skilled at lots of things. And the amount of work that you've seen we've produced, I couldn't have done a quarter of it without her. Um, and also everything that, you know, we, we talk about the QR code, the links. I mean, Petty and Rally designed that QR code. I don't even know how by themselves. Um, the drawings, every single um, protocol or pathway, for those of you who've seen me present, you've never seen diagrams of that standard. Petty and Rally actually drew those diagrams themselves. Um, so I'm just, I'm just so proud of the pouch team that I have and that we have at St. Mark's. And um, I know it's been difficult for some people who haven't been able to get hold of us and it's just been horrendous at times. But, you know, if you do send emails, as Petia said, we are, we, we do try to get back. And even if you don't have good comments, we really appreciate even negative feedback because at least it gives us, you know, the impetus to do something about it. So, and, and thank you for the Red Lion group supporting us as well. Well, that's well done, good. Petia. Well, yeah, done. well done, Petia. Fabulous, really fabulous. Well, that's, uh, that seems a very appropriate point to uh, close this evening, but lovely words, well said, uh, Zara, indeed. And um, um, can, I, can I just draw to a close? Thanks, everyone, for, for dialing in and for your questions. Um, thank you to Gary for pressing all the right buttons, as usual. Thank you for Chris, who uh, set up uh, this, this event. Well done. Uh, but most of all, um, as already said, Petya, that was absolutely fantastic and uh, uh, really, really good. Uh, yeah, big hand all round. And Zara, thank you for your contributions as well. Uh, really, really good. We'll, we'll certainly be looking to have you back again, uh, young lady, before too long. Um, just a couple of general comments, if I may. Um, the next um, RLG event is our first Monday of every month. So it's October the 4th, our open forum, just dial in. You have to register beforehand, so we know it's you, uh, but dial in for a, a general chat about pouch, all things pouch related, always, always a great start to the month. 
And on the 13th of October, our next in the series of the webcast series, we have Ellie Bradshaw, who used to head up the biofeedback group at St. Mark's. And I think the title is Crouch for Your Pouch, uh, which uh, is a terrifically uh, engaging and energetic speaker. So we look forward to that uh, very much so. And certainly pouch emptying has been on the agenda tonight and continues to be for many people. So that's, that's a good one for your diaries. 13th of October for Ellie. Um, let, let's not keep um, anyone any further. Thanks again for dialing in. And thank you very much, Petya and Zara, for your absolutely brilliant presentation. And may I say on behalf of the entire Pouch community, uh, the wonderful work that you're doing in supporting the patients day to day, week to week, month to month. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.